Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to the Underground. This is the Intel update for Friday, the 20th of May, 2022, and it is being recorded the day prior on the 19th of May. So let's get to it. Got a lot of stuff to talk about today, so I'm just going to start off with critical infrastructure concerns. And really the, the kind of oddball out is uh, the Twitter slash Elon Musk debacle situation that everyone's been following uh, over the past few weeks. Um, really, I don't have a whole lot to say about this. Um, it seems like the deal for Elon Musk to purchase Twitter is still kind of on hold slash limbo due to third-party audits revealing that a significant portion of Twitter um, Twitter accounts are actually fake, which is something that was not disclosed by Twitter as part of the agreement. So um, I guess we'll have to see how this works out. The only reason I'm mentioning it is because, again, everyone's been talking about it. And I guess social media like Twitter, especially Twitter, um, it, people rely on it. Um, whether or not you like it or not, I personally despise Twitter, no matter who owns it. I just don't like it as a platform. But despite how I feel about it, it doesn't really matter. It's still a huge um, communications platform for a lot of people on the planet. So um, I guess we'll have to keep an eye on this and see how it goes. My guess is that um, Elon Musk will probably eventually end up buying Twitter and, and seeing how that goes. As far as um, whether or not it will be a good platform or not after that, uh, I don't know. I, I highly doubt it. Um, Despite what many people might seem to think on the internet, I personally don't think that um, really any billionaire is the savior of, of mankind, right? So um, I have some I have serious reservations in, in I'm, I'm highly doubtful in anyone actually being able to uh, provide social media in such a way that it's productive because I don't think that most social media, especially Twitter, is a place where any kind of rationalism can thrive. So, uh, I will be very interested to see how it goes, and I think really the biggest part is the second and third order effects of this. Uh, if I almost think that it's probably not a good thing, uh, because if Elon Musk takes over Twitter and it's he's publicly stated that he is no longer a Democrat and he is uh, going to vote Republican in this next election, um, the fact that he said that makes me think that there's going to be a, a whole lot of conservatives uh, rushing back to Twitter uh, because they've been banned from Twitter and it's kind of obvious that Twitter is a leftist platform. Um, I think that a lot of people are going to rush right back to Twitter and we're just going to continue this goat rodeo for the next few years. And I don't think that's productive. I think that there needs to be another answer. That's why we've been working on our, um, our own solutions to this problem. Um, I don't think that Twitter is going to be a safe haven for anyone, and I don't think that it's going to be very much different than in the past. Um, you might have a lot more conservatives on it, but I think that at the end of the day, it's still a money-making platform, and I don't think that it's a place for any kind of free speech to, to take place. So, the, like I mentioned, the second and third order effects are going to be interesting to see what happens from this, but other than that, I'm really not interested in really following the, the minute details of, of who owns Twitter at any particular moment. What I'm vastly more interested in is number two there, which are the food distribution center fires, which finally someone has noticed that an awful lot of food distribution centers, production facilities, packaging factories, and warehouses have burned down lately. Now, the mind, my mind, immediately thinks, huh, interesting, isn't it? Um, this plays directly into the themes of food shortages being instigated by the government. Now, I will say that there is very little evidence either way. Um, it's just a gut feeling that there's something fishy going on when, at a time when food security has never impacted more people in the United States. Rationing is already at an all-time high since the Great Depression. Suddenly, food distribution centers start burning down. Weird, isn't it? Um, I don't know about anyone else, but I don't believe in coincidences. The, the correlation in this example is way too strong to ignore, even if there's really no evidence to indicate causation. There's no evidence to indicate what's exactly happening. So we're going to keep an eye on it, obviously, and I agree that, that all of these warehouses burning down is more suspect than a, than a ballot drop box, but I really don't have anything at all to point fingers at any entity for the reason behind these fires. Um, 
But I would say that it's awfully convenient for the U.S. government, who is constantly and consistently trying to target the U.S. citizenry, such as the infant formula shortage. Moving on to number three, the infant formula shortage is the result of a few things. For one, um, a few months ago, I'm pretty sure most people don't remember, but a few months ago there was a nationwide contamination of infant formula, causing huge disruptions in the market. Again, as we have said many times, in the field of logistics, a single factory being offline for just a short time results in widespread shortages and significant logistical challenges immediately. However, the shortage has directly been made worse by the U.S. government in the form of the FDA not allowing major factories to come back online until they meet U.S. government standards. Now, I must say that I do not know if this is a situation of the U.S. government holding these factories hostage by forcing them to meet unmeetable standards, which is slowing production, um, or if it's something else. I think, I think that's the case, but I'm not really sure. It could also be a case of manufacturers dragging their feet for a variety of reasons, but again, I'm inclined to think that the U.S. government has a huge hand in this because of what happened immediately after the story of infant formula shortages going viral. Almost immediately, this was used by pro-abortion activists as a way to push their ideology. I cannot tell you how many times I have seen pro-abortion activists directly saying, oh, you can't feed your infant? Well, you should have aborted it. I have seen that specific line a lot, brought to you from the same regime that said, if you had an electric car, you wouldn't be affected by fuel prices and shortages. The same exact mentality has been applied to having children. And I can barely contain my own anger just to get through this, but this is what I'm seeing. So yeah, there is a lot of evil in the world these days, and things like this confirm it. So for the specific shortages of infant formula, the fact that this has now gone viral means that there will be shortages everywhere. There will also be shortages of things that parents with infants also need as well. The rationale being, once parents realize that the logistical supply chains relating to their infant are vulnerable, they will buy as much stuff as they possibly can, not just formula. We're talking other um, baby supplies as well. At least that's probably what I would do. If I had an infant at home, I'd be stockpiling as much of everything as possible. So I'm not going to patronize parents by saying, only buy what you need and don't panic buy, because I know that's a futile effort. When it comes to newborns, instincts take over, and we just have to realize that panic buying is going to happen. So hopefully production capacity will be able to meet demand and we'll, uh, we'll get through this. Um, but in the meantime, uh, things are, are, are not going to be super great uh, along those lines. Moving on to number four, fuel shortages. Um, as literally everyone in the country knows, the entire country is suffering from high gas prices and availability issues as well. So it's kind of a, a twofer, right? What's a much bigger problem than high gasoline prices is diesel shortages. Right now, there is a shortage of diesel fuel all along the East Coast, which is going to wreak havoc on industry and the logistical transport of everything. So availability is an issue, but so is cost. Uh, commercial truckers are kind of freaking out over this, and rightly so, because in many cases across the country, the costs are so high that they can't even break even. Uh, if it takes $4,000 worth of fuel to transport cargo from A to B, and you're going to get paid $3,000 to do that, that's a net loss. So right now we're seeing a lot of trucking outfits, especially independent drivers, taking losses due to these high diesel prices and, and other um, shipping costs and things. Uh, high gas prices for standard gasoline are also going to sharply increase pretty soon. At least that's what the internet seems to think. I've seen some estimates by professional logistical think tanks that are expecting gasoline to possibly hit $10 per gallon by the end of this year. Um, and I don't say that lightly, and I don't say that to freak everybody out, but right now a lot of gas stations are retooling or reprogramming their their pumps to account for double digit gas prices. So next time you're fueling up, check and see if the pump has been retrofitted um, and had the screen replaced to actually add an additional place for an extra digit. That alone is a pretty big indicator because gas stations are not going to go through that expense, which surely is pretty high, unless they truly believe the gas prices will get that high. Uh, I, I personally can't even imagine gas hitting double digits. Just just me thinking about it in the past, I would have thought that some kind of civil rebellion would break out long before gas prices get close to double digits. 
Especially since we know that the Earth has enough petroleum to last humanity like another thousand years or so. What I mean is, is clearly these gas prices are a politician's invention and the result of political decisions. It's not a supply thing. Um, domestic gas prices are clearly being influenced by the federal regime, which is all too happy to find a way to target the average American. And since we're sucking all of our strategic reserves dry, the federal regime is creating the conditions for things to get really, really bad later. So even if things stay the way they are with regards to fuel shortages and prices, we're screwed. But does anyone want to take a guess as to when the next cyber attack on a pipeline or POL processing facility is going to be? A cyber attack that the FBI will magically be able to solve a week after it shuts everything down? Exactly. Everyone should expect that by now. Cyber attacks that are attributable to no single actor, and yet the federal government is able to magically solve the problem after the damage has been done. I would consider that a new norm in this fifth generation war. So with all this cheery stuff out of the way, let's move into something more exciting. Significant governmental actions. And up first is number one, uh, the issue of the Army's new recruitment ad for the PSYOP community, the perpetual pain in my rear. I wasn't even going to talk about it, but I figured I probably should because it has a slight variation of our logo in it. And for those that haven't been following us for a while, uh, we have no affiliation with Army SOCOM or really any government agency or service branch at this point. The ghost icon actually comes from a historical military unit that I personally thought was kind of cool, um, because I like to study military history and I once did a term paper on them. So I picked that because I, we needed a logo for Instagram a couple of years ago and a buddy of mine spent exactly four minutes drawing this. So And after a while it just stuck. Um, and recently, other groups, agencies, and organizations have picked up the Ghost logo and used it as well, uh, including Army PSYOPs, which, is, which makes sense because they're the descendant of that original military unit. Um, they're trying to look to history to rebrand the PSYOP community into something vastly better than it is, so they're bringing back an icon from their glory days, which I understand, to be honest. And since we're now talking about it, as far as the analysis of the video, I think that it's hilarious and also tragic at the same time. You would think that the people who would be able to read the room the most would be the PSYOP community, but apparently not. Somebody down at Bragg should have thought, hmm, you know, right now with all this information warfare going on, maybe we shouldn't put this out because the American public is going to take it the wrong way. But no, nobody thought that. And guess what? Your cloak and dagger message that would have been really cool 10 years ago now brought you into the spotlight, so way to go, genius. Remember, I'm an analyst by trade, so I guess I'm biased by knowing the culture of military intelligence, but I personally am not concerned or scared by any of the messaging in the video. Uh, I don't think it's particularly nefarious. I think it's what military leadership would look at and think, man, that's a cool recruiting video. You know, right now, a lot of dudes in the PSYOP community are high-fiving over this ad, which kind of hints to the effectiveness of the organization as a whole. And for the people that are going to say, oh, they're just talking about controlling the narrative out in the open because they always tell you their plans for the prophecy to be fulfilled, right? Let me stop you right there. The military PSYOP community is not that. There is a gigantic grand canyon of differences between military intelligence and domestic civilian intelligence. The two communities are not compatible. Which is why it's hilarious to see someone talking about the intelligence community like it's one big thing. The intelligence community is a dozen or so directors of various agencies making decisions without listening to anyone beneath them. I was a military intelligence analyst for over a decade and I never once considered myself to be part of the intelligence community. I could barely get my own commanders and bosses to listen to me, much less a congressman or the director of an agency. So to think that the intelligence community actually does any intelligence at all is laughable. It's a political organization, and it always has been. And on the military side of things, the PSYOP community is mostly known for six weeks of planning, replanning, and more planning just to drop a load of leaflets or make a single social media post that no one is going to read anyway. So all in all, the PSYOP community is about as efficient and professional as the military intelligence community, which is to say that it's crippled by bureaucracy, about 50 years behind the times when it comes to doctrine and tactics, filled to the brim with people who are just looking to appease their boss to get a promotion, and largely irrelevant when compared to one dude on Instagram making memes. 
I mean, come on, guys. I, I really hate to burst their bubble, but man, this ad is disappointing. If the PSYOP, or soft community at large, I guess, cannot take the pulse of America and realize that this recruiting ad makes them out to be the enemy of Americans, that speaks volumes about their effectiveness. They can high-five and pat themselves on their backs for finally creating a non-woke recruiting ad that is cool. And 10 years ago, I would agree with them. This would have had people lining up to join just like those Navy recruiters that set up tables outside of movie theaters that were screening Top Gun back in the day. Remember that? I get it. I really do. But not today. This ad was a swing and a miss. Too little, too late. And only effective at making regular Americans look at the SOCOM community with suspicion. So if you want an indicator of measures of effectiveness, there you go. I look at this ad as a resume for Army PSYOPs, and I'm not impressed. Again, I would have been impressed 10 or 15 years ago, but right now, if we crack open the PSYOP handbook and start evaluating this information campaign on target demographic and effects achieve, this was a disaster. If these guys can't even get their own advertisement right, what am I supposed to think about the rest of the military PSYOP community? The goal of this advertisement was to recruit people into the PSYOP community, but what did it really do? Time will tell if it failed on the recruiting aspect, but there's two things that it did succeed at. Number one, freaking out civilians and making the PSYOP community look like the enemies of the people. And two, bringing a community that thrives in secrecy into the public sphere. They shined a spotlight on themselves at a time when they are trying to fight an information war with Russia and China and everyone else. So all in all, this is, again, disappointing. I really shouldn't be disappointed. After all, the DoD's motto these days is to lower your expectations, right? I know my Navy guys out there know what I'm talking about. So, sorry for the rant, but I felt like bursting bubbles today. I've seen a lot of talk over the past couple of weeks because a lot of people have gotten too big for their britches over this Ukraine situation. A lot of military commanders think that, based on Russia's poor performance in Ukraine, they could beat them easily. Since that war is a war of information as well, I've been seeing a lot of people thinking they're hot stuff just because Russia is doing poorly. So I occasionally like to remind people that a dozen people making memes on Instagram is more effective at shaping narratives than the bureaucratic upper echelons of the PSYOP community. Up next is the proposed rule changes for this year for the WHO's international health regulations. And yes, this is really obscure. Um, this kind of ties into the WHO treaty that a lot of people are talking about, which is, it's slightly separate, but it's kind of the, it's kind of the same thing. It's really complicated. Um, but I did see this being mentioned online, and I wanted to kind of calm the situation down a bit. Um, every few months, we get inundated with emails about something to do with the WHO or the UN or NATO. Um, I remember last year, the story was the Chinese had invaded Canada. Remember that one? The videos, there's like one grainy video circulating of Chinese troops patrolling the Canadian wilderness and setting up secret bases, right? Um, or better yet, container ships full of Chinese troops being landed in California. Man, that, that story was completely made up, and it was a thorn in my side all last year. Um, it was completely false with like the tiniest, tiniest gram of truth. Um, and it circulated like wildfire online and um, big social media accounts occasionally pick it, picked it up and in turn my inbox filled up. Well, this event, the WHO rule change, has a lot more validity. So I want people to be aware of it. But I also want to prevent it from slipping down the same road as other stuff and getting kind of spun out of control. So here's what the deal is. The WHO, the World Health Organization, maintains this thing called the International Health Regulations. Kind of like a set of rules that member states have to abide by, sort of like an, uh, an international standard for health events. You see where this might be going. And every year, there are additions or corrections made. Um, to the set of rules. And this year, the Biden regime submitted some rule changes that have raised some eyebrows. Again, to prevent this from slipping into the realm of propaganda, a lot of websites have popped up calling this an attack on the United States' sovereignty, and that these rules allow the WHO to override the U.S. Constitution. I would encourage you to read the document yourselves. I will provide the link in the description, and I will put it on the sources slide as usual. I have read it, and though I am certainly no lawyer, I do not see anything that jumps out 
at me as being, holy cow, get your kit. Yes, these proposed rule changes are not good and grant the WHO a lot more authority. And I'm going to put a fat asterisk next to that word authority for later, so remember that. But when I read this, I thought, ah, they're trying to poke China. The proposed rule changes look like they are meant to target China, which is interesting. If you take the politics out of it, which is hard to do, I understand, but if you look at it objectively, you got to realize that China caused a lot of problems for the world. They warped the entire healthcare industry, especially in the international scene, and allowed the perfect conditions for tyranny to run rampant. But they also completely negated world healthcare issues and the entire planet's infrastructure for handling like legitimate contagions, right? So all in all, please read the document yourselves, but nowhere do I see anything that allows the WHO to do anything, really. And coming back to that asterisk on authority, you really have to understand how non-binding international agreements really are. And that's not even considering the fact that the United States is going to have to ratify this. The, United, the Congress is going to have to ratify it, which they, I mean, honestly, they probably will because all of Congress is on the side of the Biden regime, right? On, on stuff like this. So, but even taking that into account, honestly, all international diplomacy is just lip service. The only international diplomacy that decides issues is war. The WHO says, we order you to do X. And a nation says, make me. And the WHO backs down because they aren't going to be able to win that fight over something that small. I'm, I'm doing a really poor job of it explaining this, but just know that I'm not so concerned about this particular document. Um, what's going to happen on the national or international stage is beyond all control from us mere citizens anyway. And this applies to the, the WHO treaty that people have been talking about. It's sort of along the same lines. So you can kind of cut and paste, you know, the, the kind of explanation over onto the WHO treaty type stuff. So again, there are efforts. I will agree. There, there do seem to be efforts, um, that world leaders are taking to create more of a world government, right? It's global globalization, right? That's just, it's just the way it is. Like, look at the, um, world economic forum. I mean, there you go. There's your platform, right? If, if anybody is surprised by this at this point, I don't know what to tell you. But again, if and when international agencies start challenging U.S. authority more than they already do, we citizens will, of course, do what needs to be done. Whether or not the Biden regime literally walks into the National Archives and shreds the Constitution by hand, or if they sign away our natural rights to an international conglomerate, the effect for you and me is the same. So even if the Biden regime and Congress and the Supreme Court sign away all of our rights and sign up Americans for complete totalitarianism, my life doesn't change that much because I'm already living as if totalitarianism is here, because it is. I've talked a lot about this before, especially after the election, but what's done is done. And the fact that we are in the situation we're in, that alone has obliterated all of our founding documents and our founding ideals, at least on an institutional level. Socially, yeah, we, we can still talk about that, but institutionally, is there anything that matters anymore? They're going to do what they're going to do, whether or not they sign a piece of paper to it or not. The Biden regime did plenty of things without actually signing any executive order anyway. For how many companies went above and beyond to follow laws that did not exist, we covered that extensively too. So they don't exactly need a treaty or a piece of paper to bring in totalitarianism, but if they want to formalize it, I guess that's probably what they're going to do. So again, I've beat this horse enough, but hopefully that explains my line of thinking with things like this. 20 years ago, yeah, they probably would have thrown a president under the jail for anything that the Biden regime does on a regular Tuesday. They just break laws that often, but that's not the world we live in anymore. Things have changed. So that's really all I have on that, at least until something else comes out about it, and then I'll probably be forced to talk about it even more. Moving on to number three, the Supreme Court leak. Um... This, of course, is something that everyone has probably probably already knows about. Um, but I think that if you were to go look up what uh, Clarence Thomas has been saying on this, uh, I think he he is probably the best source for what this means for the for the future of the court. Now, I personally am no fan of Clarence Thomas for for many reasons, but um, I do think that he's correct. And I think that he has given the most accurate. Uh, portrayal of what this means for the court. I think that, of course, out of all of our government, right, out of all of our government, all three branches, um, their authority comes from the perception of their authority, 
right? And their force comes from the perception of their force. When people realize that they can't back up what they're saying, we have things like Minneapolis riots, right? So if you have that on an institutionalized national scale, if people start realizing, hey, if we don't do what the Supreme Court says, um, what are they going to do about it? They have no enforcement ability. And the Biden regime figured this out a long time ago with regards to their um, medical mandates, right? They just openly stated um, that they're not going to follow stuff. If you guys remember the press secretary um, saying that, so it's like, well, what are you going to do? You know, when the Supreme Court says something and you say, no, we're not going to do that. Um, does that mean the Supreme Court is kind of irrelevant? Well, I think so to some degree. So again, the Supreme Court thing, I think is just an illustration of the larger problem, which is, I don't know, maybe maybe a, maybe a collapsing society, maybe a decaying civilization. I don't know. Maybe a fifth generation war. I don't know. Either way, uh, clearly the institutions, particularly the justice institutions, are um, they're not doing so hot right now. And arguably they haven't been doing so hot for a very, very long time. So I guess we'll have to see what comes out about this. Um, and this is kind of related to the next one, number four, which is the... Uh, inevitable uh, Second Amendment infringements that are going to happen um, due to recent events. So moving on to that one, uh, just in time for the election cycle, there have been multiple attacks conducted by people with firearms over the past few weeks. Uh, I honestly have a lot to say about this latest one, um, the one that looks like the most obvious false flag attack since the Vegas shooting. But I'm not really going to go down that road too much. Um, all I will say is that every single thing about this attack screams that it was a false flag attack. That's just my gut feeling. I have really nothing other than that. The guy was a socialist slash communist, and his manifesto has been blacklisted by all media because that's what he said in it, which counters the narrative of white supremacy. Um... Much like how mainstream media forgot all about the DC sniper a couple of weeks ago because he was a black supremacist, this latest incident is of course being shaped by the Ministry of Truth as much as it can be, which includes removing his manifesto from the internet because specific wording in the manifesto was suspiciously similar to other shooting incidents. Honestly, this guy looks like a fed that infiltrated a white supremacist group to get clues, but they never really accepted him into the group, so he had to go to Wikipedia for his narrative, which is why nothing he said or did looks like something that a real supremacist would say or do. And something else very suspicious is the fact that he said all of the magic buzzwords and used all of the magic gear that feds want to ban. Anyone with common sense can see that there's something going on here, but since I have nothing concrete, all I can do is grumble to myself and watch what's going to happen. And here's what's going to happen. The ATF is going to use this incident to get a new director that will make David Chipman look like Barney the Dinosaur. The Biden regime is going to ban whatever they can get their hands on, and even average U.S. citizens are not going to follow those rules. Companies, particularly small companies that sell firearms or firearms gear or parts, are going to get the shaft. And most importantly, federal agencies are going to allow communist groups and terror groups like BLM to run rampant with their violent rhetoric, which is already completely unchecked by any counter-terror organization, which actively encourage these people to target people based on their ideology. Again, this is all my own opinion, which I guess is my magic caveat that is my polite way of saying that I don't care if people disagree with me. And I say all of this with a bit of vested interest, which is why I wanted to remind everyone to stay vigilant and watch your back. I know everyone says this all the time, but we here recently got a not-so-pleasant reminder of how important it is to remain vigilant in public. I do not like to talk about my own experiences with the tension in public these days um, because I only see a very small part of the world. I don't travel all over the country and I don't have a really good sample size for making an assessment of society at large, I guess. And I live in an extremely politically insane location, so my own personal experiences are certainly not representative of the nation as a whole. But one of my staff members here almost got killed or seriously injured yesterday when two people in a vehicle crossed multiple lanes of traffic to try and run us over in a parking lot while we were out running some errands. I cannot go into too many details for OPSEC reasons, but based on the occupants of the vehicle who were both wearing face masks and the political statements on the vehicle, 
Uh, it was pretty clear to me that it was a racially motivated attack, which is probably more sad to me than any other kind of attack, to be honest. But we here are all okay. Uh, I was a bit better off than our rider, who was much closer to buying the farm than I was, but they were able to evade in time. But it was a close one. Um, thankfully, at least one bystander checked to see if we were doing all right, but everyone else that saw the incident did nothing, as expected. Again, I'm talking about this nonchalantly because, honestly, this kind of thing is super common in my local area at this point. Uh, I don't live in a historically bad or high crime area. I mean, it's not the it's not the nicest place, but even in my very small part of the world, the city centers are absolutely insane. And this has only happened over the past couple of years, really. And no, we did not involve local law enforcement because our local police department does not respond to crimes like this anymore. Uh, in fact, we would be lucky if anyone even answered the phone when we called 911, so we didn't even bother. They just tell you to come in and fill out the report at the station, which I am not going to do because the police department is located in an extremely high crime area, and people are routinely attacked or mugged going into that station because people know that anyone going into the police station is unarmed. Again, if this sounds crazy, um, it is, but I'm not trying to harp on how much my own local area has gone to hell in just a couple of years. I'm mentioning this as a plea for everyone to be careful. Watch your back and do what you have to do to be safe out there. Because even in a place like where I live, where crime really wasn't a thing just a couple of years ago, there were basically no arrests in my area just a couple of years ago. And I have zero indications that things like this will get any better anytime soon. So again, be careful out there. I know, not a super cheery way to end this segment, but that's always the way it is, isn't it? Ah, uh, well, nature of the content, I guess. So let's move to international issues. Up first is Russia. Uh, I'm obviously not going to be talking too much about it due to YouTube's policies, which um, ban us from talking about anything bad Ukraine might be doing. Um, so we're just not going to talk about it. But the thing I did want to talk about is this anti-Russian sentiment and how things have gotten out of control on that front. Um, I'm just going to say up front, you always need to leave someone and out. Like on the high school debate team, you never want to back someone into a corner because when you do, they just stop playing the game and nothing productive happens. And the Russian people have been hurt. Thousands of Russian mothers will never see their sons again, and all because of a war that they didn't ask for. Russia has lost more soldiers in a month than the U.S. lost in Afghanistan in 20 years. Think about that for a second. Think about how you felt every night when Dan Rather cut to a soldier's DA photo as the nightly news ended, using the same B-roll from the last time a soldier got killed. I don't know about you, but I damn near lost it every time. And I still get angry thinking about how my youth was spent watching soldiers' photos scroll by on the evening news. Now think about what Russians are feeling right now with their extreme losses. I don't know about anyone else, and even though YouTube has ordered us to not talk about Ukraine's crimes... I am not going to kick someone when they're down, even if they are an adversary. Russia has learned many lessons, all of them the hard way. And even though the anti-Russian mass hysteria is in full swing, my personal opinion is that if the West keeps kicking Russia when they are down, we are not going to like what that brings in the future. For me, Russia is an adversary, but not an enemy. The relationship between Russia and the United States is competitive and adversarial on many topics, for better or worse. But for me, the Russian people are certainly not an enemy. My enemies are the people that started this mess, on all sides. And in my day-to-day -day life, my enemies are certainly more domestic than foreign at this point. Right now, with all of this anti-Russian hysteria, people are playing with fire. They are playing with fire and they don't know it, because the political elites are treating this Ukraine situation just like every other issue they use to rile people up. Years ago, it was Occupy Wall Street then climate change, then it was religion by way of refusing to make a wedding cake, then Robert De Niro's anti-jab stuff, then back to climate change, then Russiagate, then veganism or election stuff, and back to climate change, then BLM and Antifa, then the virus that cannot be named, then back to climate change again, then Ukraine and now Roe vs. Wade. I wonder how much YouTube is going to shadow ban this video just because of that paragraph I just read. But anyway, you see the point. Ukraine was just a plaything, which has apparently now been cast aside. But Ukraine, out of all of these issues, was a very dangerous thing for mass hysteria to latch on to. There are real concerns here. This is not a game. 
There are real defense issues to work through, both tactically and socially within the U.S. military. There are lessons to be learned in the civilian sector, too, most of all among citizens, again for tactical and social reasons. All I'm saying is that there are a lot of things going on right now with regards to Russia and Ukraine, and this mass hysteria that we're seeing is severely warping what should be happening. Like we mentioned before, banning Russia's access to banking is a crime, but Visa and MasterCard did it anyway. That's going to come back to bite us hard. Things that we do not think about are also affected. Think about the international search and rescue community. The U.S. and Russia coordinate a lot of rescue efforts because we have joint agreements with regards to search and rescue satellites. Same thing with the space program, or international shipping, or trying to work with China because Russia is the only quasi-friend that China has got. So our efforts to combat China are affected by Russia too. Even though I personally think Russia was definitely in the wrong to invade Ukraine, poking the bear and letting mass hysteria get way out of control so that that poke becomes a shove is not productive. Right now we need world leaders to put on some big boy pants and solve problems rather than creating them like they always have done. We need people to mediate international relations and start working towards solutions for this because this has gotten way nastier than I think anybody ever expected. But that's warfare for you. But no, what we have is incompetent world leaders playing with fire because they either, one, don't remember the Cold War for what it really was, or two, have been in politics for so long that they are incapable of seeing any form of reality. And that, in my opinion, is not good. And speaking of this Russia craziness, let's move on to Finland and Sweden joining NATO potentially. So for those who haven't heard, Finland and Sweden have both officially submitted their applications to join um, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, um, and the proceedings are kind of going on right now. Uh, right now, it's everything's kind of stalled as far as I know. Um, Turkey is kind of holding up the proceedings a little bit and kind of causing a, a ruckus, but um, a lot of people are going to ask, what does this mean and is this good or bad? Uh, I don't know if it's good or bad, but I will say that it's not good for relations and it's not good for tensions. Um, it, it will escalate the situation even more than the U.S. has over the past month. In my opinion, like I have any bearing on world events or what I say matters whatsoever, I think that they should have waited. Finland would still have been perfectly justified, along with Sweden and Norway, in joining NATO two or three years from now. Granted, I understand that they are trying to strike while the iron is hot and never let a good crisis go to waste, but this, I think, is too soon. Russia is still wounded from how the Ukraine situation worked out, and right now they are likely to lash out in ways that we are not going to like. So I think that Finland and Sweden joining NATO is going to cause more problems than it's worth. Um, clearly, Russia is incapable of taking even Ukraine, arguably the easiest target on their border, to suggest that Russia even has the slightest hope at successfully invading Finland or Sweden or Poland for that matter is laughable. Granted, if I was Finnish or Swedish or Norwegian, I would feel differently. Historically, being situated close to Russia has been hazardous for one's health. So Scandinavian countries increasing their civil defense is always a good idea. I think that civil defense is one of the best justifications for even having a government, but also it's one of the most util underutilized sectors of government. Here in the U.S., our civil defense procedures haven't been updated since the 1980s, which is a shame. But anyway, NATO membership, eh, I think that that's going to cause more problems than it's going to solve. Um, Norway, Sweden, and Finland certainly do not have large militaries, but they are vastly more prepared than Ukraine was in 2014. And they have history and geography on their side. So... All in all, I think this NATO membership situation is the result of politicians getting something rather than a legitimate defense effort. And it's going to cause Russia to react, and Russia's reaction is going to escalate an already tense situation even more. And it's going to justify everything Russia has done. As is, Russia has no leg to stand on. But if Scandinavia joins NATO, Russia can say, Look, they really are trying to surround us. We need to strike first. A very dangerous position to be in, and that's exactly where we're heading. Moving down to India and Sri Lanka, there is mass civil unrest underway. Right now, the situation in Sri Lanka is not doing too well. Uh, Sri Lanka is basically out of fuel, um, which is a major barrier to food shipments around the nation. 
India also has stopped exporting wheat because of their own food security issues, which has caused even more food shortages in Sri Lanka because they're a major, obviously a major trading partner. Um, in short, the people of Sri Lanka are starving, and pandemonium has been the result of that. There is an old saying that we are only three meals away from total anarchy, meaning that if a population's food supply gets disrupted for even just a single day, for three meals in a row, mass hysteria and civil unrest will result. Right now, Sri Lanka is finding out exactly how true that idea is, and it seems to be pretty accurate. On social media, I found some pretty gnarly stuff, including local politicians being tortured and beaten by their starving constituents. I obviously cannot show these videos here, and I'm not sure if I'd want to anyway, because if you just search out there yourself, you'll find some pretty nauseating stuff. In any case, the situation for Sri Lanka does not look good, and even though the situation is desperate, it does not hold a candle to the international famine we will see if this trend spreads to the rest of Southeast Asia, or even elsewhere. So, keep an eye on Sri Lanka, and India too. Hopefully the logistical nightmares can reach at least some level of resolution soon. And finally, Somalia. The Biden regime has deployed several hundred soldiers to Somalia. And yes, I know what you're thinking. Nothing bad has ever happened in Somalia, right? Well, right now the Biden regime has stated that the number of troops will be capped at 450, but my assessment is that this is what we call a lie. This is because the Department of Defense proudly concealed the true number of troops that were in Afghanistan under Trump, and especially in the past couple of years. Everything the DoD has done has indicated that the upper echelons of the DoD is purely rotten to the core. So my guess is that those 450 troops will probably be double, triple, or even quadruple that, simply just for tourism patches. And that's not including the various ODAs and teams that have been in Somalia for years fighting Al-Shabaab, AQAP, and the like. Groups which will only increase in size. The reason for this deployment has yet to be released, however, I have my own guesses. Um, a couple of weeks ago there was a regime change, and the new guy in charge was backed by the U.S. Shocking, I know. But now it looks like the U.S. is protecting their investment, and at the same time trying to counter China's influence in the Horn of Africa, which has been expanding significantly under the guise of counter-piracy. So, I don't know if Somalia is going to be the new Afghanistan. I highly doubt it. It's just, it's a completely different fight. It's a completely different set of mission set. It's it's not really comparable. Um, but you never know, right? Um, the DoD is, is all about furthering the military-industrial complex because, you know, politicians in uniform have got to get their uh, Raytheon stocks up, right? So, there's no telling what's going to happen. Um, I, like I've been saying for a long time, there are a lot of bad dudes in, in Africa with regards to um, Al-Qaeda and things like that. The, the Sahel region out west and to the north uh, north part of this northern part of Africa and north uh, Saharan region, man, they're just eat up with AQAP dudes and, and Al-Qaeda and Al-Shabaab and a lot of other groups that I forget. Um, same thing in Sudan, Ethiopia, Eritrea, places like that. It's just become a hot spot for global insurgency. And, um, you know, I guess the opinion, is, you can have different opinions on whether or not we should be there or not. Uh, and I think there's opinion, that's a valid question to ask for sure. Uh, but uh, there's nothing I can do <laughs> to change a DOD's deployment, right? So, I don't know. What's going to happen is going to happen, I guess. And uh, for those of you who have not been reading up on Somalian history, that right now would probably be a good time to do so. Um, because... It uh, hasn't hasn't been a really good one. So, in any case, that's really all I've got for today. Thank you again for watching, everyone. Um, we'll have another one of these briefs out pretty soon because I'm pretty sure that I've got twice as much content that I haven't even talked about yet. Um, and, of course, things are going to get even crazier domestically and internationally over the next few weeks or so. So, I guess we'll, uh, we'll circle back around and uh, talk some more about some of these issues when they inevitably become more, um, much more bigger problems than they are right now. But for now, that's, that's really all I've got. So thanks again for watching, and we will see you next time. And as always, fight in the shade.